1 Thessalonians. To wait for his son from heaven. A layman looks at Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Keith Gorgas 2020. 1 Thessalonians 5 Part 2. In light of what we know of the future end of all things, there is a manner of life that corresponds to that light. Christianity is never about just know about the truth. It needs to sink from our minds to our hearts and on down to our feet. The writers of this letter conclude with some practical advice on how to live for the Lord while we await his return. But we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord, and give you instruction, and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. It must have been a wonderful thing to have the apostles of our Lord Jesus who had walked with him and were eyewitnesses of his resurrection around in the early church period. Can you imagine hearing things firsthand from Peter or John or James? Or from Paul, who had encountered the Lord on the Damascus Road and been caught up into the third heaven? The Holy Spirit was giving inspiration of the New Testament scriptures to provide enduring doctrine or teaching for the church to go one for another two thousand years. What is presented here is enduring truth that can be practiced today. We do not have the apostles present with us, or even their appointed delegates, but we do have the living and abiding word of God. We see people that the Lord has raised up to care for our souls. From the heart, they love for our well-being, and labor towards it. We are to recognize them and submit to their care. We are told to hold them in high regard. In raising children, I am sure most parents encounter this. There are times when a child may bristle and resist all oversight. They may argue every point, and rebel against instruction. To simply get them to tidy their rooms or make their beds may not seem worth the effort, because of the resistance they provide. You would think you'd ask the child to swim through a swamp full of snakes and alligators for their parents' personal profit or entertainment when really they are just being taught something that will serve them well later in life. At other times a child may yield and submit to instruction, and everything seems so smooth and wonderful. That is the way the Lord wants us to be with those saints who take the lead in helping us in our Christian life. We are to recognize their efforts to assist us and help us grow in the Lord, and make life as easy as we can for them with our cheerful responses. Live in peace with one another. Nothing mars the testimony of the church like in fighting and unrest. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. It takes communion with the Lord to understand the root of people's problems and failures. Some are self-willed and unruly. Some are scared. Some are weak. It takes patient discernment to know how to deal with each case. The unruly need to be admonished. The faint-hearted need encouragement. The weak need to be helped. The cowardly lion needs a heart, the straw man needs a brain, and the tin man needs oil. The one helping needs patience. Nothing is accomplished by losing our patience and our tempers. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all people. Retaliation comes naturally to the flesh, but has no part in the church. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is that we remain in constant thankful communion with Him. Habitual thanksgiving is a needed ingredient of the Christian walk. Prayer in every circumstance is the key to always rejoicing. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not utterly reject prophecies, but examine everything, hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. This might be better understood as quench not the Spirit. Do not lightly esteem prophecies, but prove all things. Hold fast the right, hold aloof from every form of wickedness. Our current program of how we do church inhibits carrying these commands out fully. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church let the prophets speak, two or three, and let the others judge. Their meetings were open for the leading of the Holy Spirit to use whatever mouthpiece he desired to speak to the church. We have teachers and very good ones, but a prophet is an oracle of God, and can voice God's mind in a current situation. If there is no avenue for the prophets to speak, we have in effect quenched the Holy Spirit. Can this liberty lead to disorder? 
Of course it can when men speak without a direct word from the Lord, but when faith responds in obedience to the Lord's instructions, we can expect blessing. We are not to take everything said under the pretext of prophesy, but to test or prove all things by the word of God. That is the responsibility of the congregation, and to hold fast to what is right and let go of what is wrong. We must be aloof of every form of evil. It demands a careful walk. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will do it. Paul's prayer was for every aspect of the Thessalonians lives to be blameless, spirit, soul, and body. It is all in view of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us to that, and he will perform it, because he is faithful. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Paul and his helpers felt the need of the prayers of the saints. Reciprocal prayer is natural and to be expected in the Christian community. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I put you under oath by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. A kiss is the conveyance of affection. It was to be a holy, not an impure kiss, and not a hug that could give rise to impure passions. It was very important to make sure that all the saints in the church had this letter read to them. The writers put them under oath to do that, because they would tolerate no cracks in the assembly that might lead to division down the road. Great mischief is worked when communications are limited to an oversight committee comma or just the elders. The Lord takes his place in the midst of his people, not in a subcommittee. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Here is the fuel for all that is good among Christians the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the grace of Christ our Saviour and the Father's boundless love with the Holy Spirit's favour rest upon us from above. Thus, may we abide in union with each other and the Lord and possess in sweet communion joys which earth can e'er afford.